Our New Testament reading this morning comes me, from Revelation 1 through 6. And to the angel of the church of Sardis write the words of him who has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know your works. You have the name of being alive, and you are dead. Awake and strengthen what remains and is on the point of death. For I have not found your works perfect in the sight of my God. <clears throat> Remember then what you received and heard. Keep that and repent. If you will not awake, I will come like a thief, and you will not know at what hour I will come upon you. Yet you have still a few names in Sardis, people who have not soiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. He who conquers shall be clad thus in white garments, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life. I will confess his name before my Father and before his angels. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. The word of the Lord. Thanks. Not originally part of my uh, sermon plan for this morning, but since Ken was talking about pet peeves in the introduction this morning, I will mention a pet peeve of mine. Fortunately, I have not heard it uh, too often here in this church. But please note that it is the book of Revelation, singular, and not the book of Revelations, plural. It is one revelation, just a long one to be sure. Also, I want to thank the choir for and David for the beautiful rendition of Amazing Grace, My Chains Are Gone. And I have to admit, I am so thankful that this church uses a litur liturgist because uh, that song always brings a tear to my eye. And uh, I don't know how I could have read Revelation 3 right after Amazing Grace. So thank you, choir, and thank you, Ken, for the reading of the scripture. The community of Sardis was founded around 700 BC and at one time had a reputation of being a great city, so great in it, as a matter of fact, that the ancient Greeks considered it to be the greatest of all cities. It also had the reputation of being impenetrable because the back wall of the city was a very steep cliff and there was a river that flowed nearby uh, Sardis that provided protection from the other sides of the wall. And yet, even though it was considered impenetrable, the city was conquered on two separate occasions. The first time was in the mid-500s BC, and then once again in 214 BC. Both times when they were captured, they were not conquered by brute force, but they were defeated because guards guarding the entrances were inattentive and allowed the enemy to sneak in. With that history of Sardis being defeated twice due to guards not being alert, we can well imagine what that wake-up call that the Lord will issue in this letter would mean to the people in Sardis. We, too, would be wise to make sure that we hear the wake-up call as well. In verse 1 of chapter 3, our Lord declares that he holds the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Now, we know from our discussion of when we looked at the letter of, to the church in Ephesus and the fact that our Lord explains it in chapter 1 of Revelation that the seven stars represent the seven Asian churches that are receiving this revelation. However, when I first read this past week, the seven
seven spirits of God, I'm like, did I fall asleep during that class in my seminary preparation? Doesn't the Lord God have only one spirit? As it turns out, I am right, there is only one spirit. But, in this case, the number seven is being used symbolically. In the ancient days, the number seven represented the number of completeness or the number of perfection. Just like now, we might say this person is a perfect ten, meaning that they are perfect. Therefore, when Christ said that he holds the seven spirits, what he is saying is that he has the complete essence of God within him. He's not a messenger, but he is really God incarnate. The Lord then continues by saying that he is well, rep well aware of the reputation that Sardis has for being alive. However, the very next sentence goes, but that reputation is no longer accurate. He then issues a warning for the town of Sardis to wake up. Now I have to admit, this past week I spent some time trying to be creative. I was trying to figure out how can I do wake up and with this being Veterans Day, push a button and have a bugler blow revelry. It almost makes me wish that I had been more uh, conscientious when I was taking the trumpet in elementary school. And maybe I could use a uh, trumpet, but that just didn't work out. Sorry about that. Our Lord continues his critique by issuing two instructions to the church in Sardis. The first instruction is to wake up and strengthen what remains before it dies. He then declares that what Sardis has done is not measuring up to the Almighty's standards. I sort of see this as a teacher. When I was a school teacher, about halfway through each quarter, there was a requirement in our district that we send home progress reports to any student who might be in danger of failing that quarter. I think right now our Lord is issuing a progress report to Sardis. What that progress report is saying is, you better wake up and get your act together, otherwise you will fail in the course known as the course of life. In verse 3, our Lord continues by saying, that they should remember what they received and heard, and then obey it and repent. As I thought about this during the week, I wondered, okay, what is it that the Lord would really want us to hear and remember? I came up with a very brief list that would at least move the church of Sardis from that F that they were currently getting up to a C. First and foremost, we re need to remember that Jesus indeed is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father except through Him. That's the starting point. Then as I continue to think, other lessons came to mind, such as remembering and obeying the Ten Commandments. I also think that our Lord would expect us to take seriously the great commission that he issued to the 11 remaining original disciples just before he ascended into heaven. For those of you who may not be familiar with it, that great commission is that we are to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey everything that the Lord has commanded us. If we got those points down, we would be off to a good start. We could at least pass the elementary school level of being Christians. Then verse 3 ends with a word of warning. 
That word of warning is, if the community of Sardis decides not to respond to the Lord's blowing of reveille in this letter, in other words, if they do not wake up, or as Eugene Peterson so eloquently put it in the message, which is Peterson's paraphrase of the Bible, if the people of Sardis decide to pull the covers back over your head and sleep on, the Lord will come like a thief in the night. Remember, back in the introduction, I stated that Sardis was twice conquered, not because they were overpowered, but because their guards were asleep at, on duty, and they allowed their enemies to sneak in and conquer them. Imagine what this wake-up call that the Lord is issuing of Him coming like a thief in the night if you're still sleeping would mean to the, the community in Sardis. Now, maybe up to this point, you have, and if you have been paying attention during the four previous letters to the church's sermons that I've been giving, you might have been wondering, where is the good news that the Lord always has for the churches? After all, in the first four letters, the Lord starts off with, these are the good things that I see you doing. And then he gets into the bad spot. Now, just in case you were wondering, did I fall asleep during Pastor Steve's sermon and Ken's reading of Scripture, and did I miss the good points that Sardis has? Let me reassure you, you have not missed the good points. The problem was, the Lord did not have anything to command this church that had a great reputation, but was actually dying. The Lord could not find one thing to say, Church in Sardis, keep doing this because you're doing it well. When we get to verse 4, we see the closest thing that the Lord has as a compliment to this church. He said, notice that there are, a, there are a few, a few people in your church who have not spoiled their clothing. Now, as a school teacher, I saw that and I'm like, yeah, I know what that is. I come back from having a substitute in my class the day before, and the report reads, the class was terrible, except for Becky and Mary and John. Now, I have to admit, while I am glad to hear that there were Greek students who knew how to behave, I was pretty upset that in a class of anywhere from 35 to 40 students, the teacher could only say good things about a few of them, and I let the, my, the rest of my class have it when I came back the next day. What the Lord is saying is that, yeah, there are a couple of people who are in the Sardis church who are awake. They are remembering what they have heard, and they're actually obeying what they have heard. However, for the church in general, that is not a high praise. The Lord continues to say, but for those very few who did not soil their clothes, or as Peterson puts it, have ruined themselves by wallowing in the muck of the world's ways. For those people who have not stained their clothes, their reward is the opportunity to walk with the Lord dressed in white. Furthermore, their names will never be blotted out of the book of life. Now, in case you haven't read Revelation before, having our names found in the book of life is necessary in order to be admitted into heaven during the second coming. Now, I know there are some people who love to preach that once you say you believe in Christ, you're saved, deal done, 
There's nothing that can take away your salvation from that point on. However, to those who would preach such a lesson, I would love to have them read Revelation 3 and explain how you can never have your name blotted out in the book of life when Christ himself says that it's only those who have been found righteous who will not have their name blot, blotted out. Now, I, I will confess and I take great comfort in the fact that Paul wrote in Romans that the righteous shall live by faith and then goes on to say that we will never be able to work our way into heaven. In other words, our deeds will never be enough in and of themselves to make it into heaven. But what James says in his epistle is also true. And I'm sure most of you know this line. Faith without works is dead. dead. Very good. Faith without works is dead. Sardis was being warned that the Lord knew that they had a reputation for being alive. And once upon a time, that reputation was well earned. But in recent years, that community in Sardis that was at one time alive was on the verge of dying because of their recent works were being found as lacking. If we have faith in Jesus, we should be producing works that are commensurate with our faith. If our faith is not producing works, then perhaps it's time for us to hear the bugle call of revelry that our Lord has blown here in this letter to Sardis. Finally, we are told that to those who overcome, they will be acknowledged before the Father and His angels. That can get me excited. Now, I am a little bit too old to get excited about the fact that there are only 43 more days till Christmas. However, I am still very excited about the fact that when I get to heaven, as long as I keep hearing, remembering, and then of repenting when I fall short of the goal, that there will be one day when I'm up in heaven and Jesus is going to have his arm around me and go before God the Father and say, Father, this is Steve. He is one of ours. And what a great joy that will be to have our Lord acknowledge us before our uh, Heavenly Father. That's something I can get excited about. As we come to the close of this message, let us indeed hear what the Spirit is saying to all of the churches. It is time to wake up. Reveille has been blown. The question is, are we alert and awake? Or have we just rolled over and hit the snooze button and gone back to sleep? Let us remember what we have been taught and then obey it, repenting when necessary. May we be found to be one of those who are dressed in white, walking with the Lord when judgment day comes. Amen. Amen.